thank you very much indeed for inviting me here. Um, I feel very privileged because I think this is a really, really important topic and hopefully there's going to be lots of interesting things being discussed. As you see on the screen, the theme of this year's, um, this, this uh, talk is the mental health in an un unequal world. Um, and we're recognizing the health inequalities that COVID-19 has revealed and really reinforced in societies throughout the world, really, uh, including the United Kingdom, the different areas that unfortunately, the deprivation as well. The pandemic has had an impact on the wider well-being as well, as we all know, with unemployment and mental health, um, domestic violence, which I know I saw the recent statistics, which has clearly gone up, um, lack of physical activity um, and economic hardship. And it's really important to recognise that people's ability to access mental health services has been impacted by the pandemic and they're now um, longer waiting lists and in some cases post uh, COVID illnesses like uh, long COVID. We have a variety of speakers this morning, very exciting speakers, and I'm just really looking forward to hearing them, um, who are going to be talking about how they're supporting clients faced with this inequality. And I think what's particularly interesting is that each one of the speakers will be sharing their organisation's viewpoint about how we can actually work together to support the levelling up of our communities. Residents have clearly told us that they see mental wellbeing promotion as a priority in the borough. And at the Health and Wellbeing Board, which I chair, we're learning about how Barnet Public Health are working together to promote good mental health across all ages and working with different communities to prevent um, serious mental illness, substance abuse and suicide, things that we're going to hear about later. Um, I thought about it this morning before I actually came on. One of the things that a lot of people don't understand about the changes uh, are happening within, within the um, health environment. So I thought just quickly before we went on, I would just maybe try and undo some of the confusion. The Clinical Commissioning Group um, is a group that uh, we are part, we have, we had our Barnet Clinical Commissioning Group. And in April 2020, in the middle of the pandemic, I don't know how this happened, it was a crazy time, but Barnet, Cams and Enfield, Haringey and Islington all came together. Um, and they formed something called the North Central London Clinical Commissioning Group, which I'm sure a lot of you have heard about. Or if you see the information, it's the NCLCCG. And this supports commissioning health services at scale for the whole of the North Central London, which is a very big group of people while retaining borough level commissioning of local services where appropriate. And I have to tell you, it has been unbelievable that the five chairmen of the, of the different health and wellbeing boards have become a very powerful group of, of people. So that when something comes up, particularly something like mental health and inequality, we will fight for now, not only for our individual boroughs, but as a group. And as a group, we're much, much more powerful because obviously our population is huge and there's big sums of money and I do think we've always Barnet in particular has always been sort of the underdog not getting money and actually that is definitely changing. There's all now going to be something very important happening which is the North Central under the CCG is going to be formed into something called the ICS which again you might see written in a lot of places which is the integrated care system. And it has as a core, it's really important, is improving population health and health care, as well as trying to tackle inequality outcomes and access, but also really um, enhancing productivity and value for money, something that's really important. Now working as a whole that makes things a lot more efficient, just to help the NHS support a broader social and economic development. And the CCG is working closely with um, its colleagues, including trusts, councils, community providers, primary care, so that the implications of this brand new integrated care system is going to be much, much better, more efficient, and it's all going to be coming as a statutory body in April 2022. So watch out for that. But hopefully, I just thought it's really important because I keep, I keep seeing it written on things. And I think, do people really know what it means? So Barnet Public Health is rapidly working to manage and reduce COVID risk factors and the differential impact of COVID with particular emphasis and focus on the BAME uh, communities. And there are many examples of this, and I know they're going to be highlighted this morning. Something I just wanted to say that there are things that are going to be discussed this morning that 
all of us will find difficult. But if there's something that it really hits you and you think this is not something I feel happy about, just turn your screen off. And in the chat, there's going to be some numbers and some information that if you felt that today you wanted to speak to somebody, you can. But there'll also be numbers of, of other places that you can reach. Maybe if tomorrow or next week, write it down and you'll have that, that information if you need it. So we have a very action packed morning. So I will now hand over to Julie Powell, um, who is going to give us an overview and update on the activities and plan for the Barnet Wellbeing Service this autumn. So over to you, Julie. Thank you very much, Caroline. That was fabulous introduction and welcome everybody. It's um, quite poignant Hub Connections this year, this, this quarter, because it is focusing on mental health, um, World Mental Health Day. But what I want to do is just give you an update on the Barnet Wellbeing Service over the last quarter. So if I could have the next slide, please, Barney. So this, of course, is just a reminder of all the different partners that make up the Barnet Wellbeing Service. It's a fabulous group of organisations. And in truth, there are more that I think need to be included. So maybe we need to think about how we present this information going forward. But I hope you get a sense of the different types of organisations that um, are really important and integral to the success of um, this partnership. Thank you. So over the last quarter, what we've been doing is, is continuing to um, increase and expand our, our range of community interventions. And these are the four platforms that we've really focused on this, um, this quarter, which is about um, establishing a recovery college that's being de delivered by Minding Enfield and Barnet. And this is really to support people to develop school and tools and almost a resilience toolkit to help them to self-manage their mental health and to, um, to recognise when they're starting to feel unwell. Barnet Friends, which is which grew out of the COVID response service last summer, has been working with and supporting people who are feeling isolated, who are feeling lonely, who are feeling mm. a bit anxious about stepping out into the wider community as COVID restrictions lift. And for some of those people, um, they also are living with a um, severe mental illness. So we've, we're really pleased that we've got um, some clinical support provided through a um, supervisor from the uh, Barnet and Enfield and Haringey Mental Health Trust. New Citizens Gateway um, have been supporting um, refugees and asylum seekers who have been located in the borough and for many of them um, with all the, the recent activities around Afghan arrivals, many of them have been really be, be, um, become re-traumatised through, um, through their own experiences. And it's been really heartening to see the work that this um, really small but impactful charity has been delivering. And then, of course, we've got Bonnet Wellbeing Hub, which is um, delivered by Meridian Wellbeing, which is the front um, the, the front door of the service and that is continuing to support people who are struggling with their um, emotional well-being, continuing to complete emotional health checks and we've also been very much supporting um, people's reintegration into wider society using um, physical activities, um, some of which we'll be sharing later today. Um, as you can see in the corner, we've got our Barnet um, Wellbeing Annual Report. We decided to do it over two years, so we're hoping that that will be um, uploaded onto the Wellbeing website um, in the next month or so, and that will just give you a flavour of really how early intervention services have had to change to respond to COVID. And I think the wellbeing service working very closely with a whole range of partners has been really at the forefront of that, but also working with statutory partners like the CCG who fund this service and of course the council. Thank you, Barney. 
So one of the, the new service updates that some of you may not be aware of is the NHS Blood Donation Project. And this is really about reaching out to um, uh, black communities um, across the NCL footprint. You know, Caroline's been talking about the new integrated care system. And what we've been doing is going out and running awareness campaigns with different communities because there's been, you know, there's a real um, uh, lack of blood donations from this community. And as many of you will be aware, the, um, there's just been announced recently the, um, a new treatment for sickle cell, um, the first in about 20 years. And, you know, people with sickle cell are so literally, their lives depend on blood donation. So it's been really interesting for us to be part of this um, NCL piece of work and uh, Veronica who's um, un unable to be with us unfortunately who's been leading this program has really been going out and about talking to people and engaging with people and supported by our kickstart um, colleague Chandani. Thank you. Next right so the next slide is about suicide well suicide prevention month so um, in September, Barnet Suicide Prevention Partnership, um, through the uh, through the Wellbeing Service, ran a whole month of activities. We had just um, under two hundred people participate in a range of activities, podcasts, face to face conversations, and it was really about raising awareness around suicide and the support that is available for people who um, are experience, experiencing suicidal ideation and who, all whose lives may have been impacted by suicide. And what I really enjoyed about the programme was that we had a whole range of different partners come in and talking. So, for example, we had the Met Police who talked about their statutory responsibilities. We had We Are Hummingbird, which is a small organisation that uses music as a platform to talk about suicide awareness. Um, we had some big partners like Rethink Mental Illness, but also smaller organisations like Magpie Res Respite um, Centre, which is um, a residential care home for people who have, um, <clears throat> who have undertaken, uh, who've needed support around their, uh, their suicidal thoughts. Um, we've had the listening place uh, do um, present work on their um, on on the services and support that they've been doing, and of course the survivors of bereavement by suicide, which is an NCL wide service, and there were a range of podcasts that were delivered um, by our partners, including Meridian Wellbeing and the Mental Health Foundation and Calm. So. Uh, so Hare from Bonnet Public Health will talk a little bit more about how this work is being um, taken forward going um, for, um, in, later on in the uh, presentation. But if I can have the next slide, please, Barney. So this is some of the work that we're continuing to do with the wellbeing service. So we've been supporting public health to um, support the COVID-19 vaccine program over the, really for the best part of the calendar year. And that's been really interesting doing some focused work with different communities. We've been growing the Barnet Wellbeing website. So please do have a look at it and um, please um, comment on it, share it with people. Our, our Young People Thrive programme um, aimed at young people aged 18 to 25, we'll be talking about in a little bit more detail through Zoe. And we've also been um, contributing to an article in the wellbeing column in Barnet Post. And I'd also like to encourage you all to read the Wellbeing newsletter, which is published twice a month on the Barnet Wellbeing website. And uh, this month, we've been talking a lot about the impact of physical activity to um, support and improve mental wellbeing. And finally, I'd just like to remind you all that on the Wellbeing website, we also have the Simply Connect 
directory and this is a live real-time directory which is being managed through i believe the gla and organizations can add information about themselves and the activities that they're actually um, delivering and that information will be available um, to the public immediately so please do use that it's a local resource it's it's real time and it's just a way of ensuring that we continue to remain connected in these slightly unusual times so um thank you very much indeed and as as i say working together always works and i'd like to hand you over to our next speaker kimberly davis from change pro living barnet who's a dual diagnosis practitioner and they're going to be talking about the impact of um, substance misuse and how that impacts on people's well-being and mental health thank you very much Okay, so I'm just going to give you an overview of the service and kind of as it says how to how to make a referral sort of our, our future plans and yeah I'm just going to kind of give you a brief overview. Thanks Marnie. So as it says we range we, we run a range of medical interventions um, so opiate substitute prescribing which is to support people um, for reducing and uh, coming off heroin, um, and that's in the form of uh, methadone, buprenorphine, espinal. So there's a, there's a small range of, uh, of things that, that we offer here, um, as well as alongside kind of PSI, psychosocial interventions. So everyone that comes through is allocated uh, a recovery coordinator, um, and each member of staff carries a slightly different caseload depending on the substances that the individual is using. Uh, because the uh, interventions can, can differ slightly. Um, and we have a, a full programme um, as well of, of groups, um, which is, is the main thing that we're encouraging people um, to use as times aren't like they used to be when we have lots of workers, small caseloads, and people were able to offer sort of weekly one-to-one -one, um, support. Uh, we aren't able to offer that anymore. Um, what we do offer as recovery coordinators is more, more check-ins. Um, we're really actively looking to provide a more wraparound service uh, for people to be engaging in the work uh, group work program and also other activities. Um, so whether that's uh, we we also um, have some exercise classes. We have an allotment group. Um, we'd be looking at what other support needs that person has ensuring they're engaged uh, with those services um, as well and seeing what activities they have. Um, we also have alcohol relapse prevention medication um, as, as part of one of our sort of medical uh, clinical interventions um, and uh, community alcohol uh, detoxes. Um, and we can look at funding for inpatient detoxes and in some cases um, rehab rehabilitation for longer periods of time as well. We do double virus testing here for anybody that is engaged in our service. It's not open to everybody. And um, vaccinations and treatments should people uh, come back positive for bloodborne virus. Um, we also provide GP shared care, which is for those, uh, there's a lot of, Barnet has a high number of people that hit the 15 year and above bracket for being on OSC or MAP, which is medically assisted treatment. So that's the, the old school maintenance of, of methadone. So where we have that cohort of clients, we try wherever possible to move them into the GP shared care. There's generally much smaller movement within that community um, of reducing or changing uh, patterns and behaviors. So that they're, they're best suited to sit under the GP shared care where it's, quite, it's a less in intent um, and, a, and a lower level of expectation of, of change to, to meet with, with where they're at in their journey. Um, we also provide in-house uh, needle exchange for anybody that's registered us as well. Um, the, the, next slide is, the next point on the slide is kind of showing the um, variety of what sorry Barney no it was just the next point on the slide thank you um it's just showing kind of the variety of different workers that we have so we work within police stations we work within the prisons 
not so much at the moment, obviously with the COVID restrictions, but this is, is how it would have been. Um, uh, so yeah, prison link workers, we have a health promotion lead, we have a member of staff that works in Barnet and Edgeware hospitals, a hospital liaison worker, um, GP shared care workers, uh, alcohol specific workers, non-opiate specific workers, um, as well as opiate workers. So the non-opiate workers would be working with anybody that's using anything that doesn't fit into one of the other categories. So that's anything from benzodiazepines to um, uh, to uh, ketamine, crack, cocaine, cannabis. Uh, that and as I was saying, we have psychosocial interventions, mainly in the form of kind of the group work program. There's a lot that goes on on there. Um, so CGL um, has a funded program called Foundations of Change, and there's three elements to that, depending on people where people are on their journey. <coughs> we provide a men's group, a women's group. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, and as I said, we have the allotment group. Um, we have an anger management group um, as well. <clears throat> as previously mentioned, we have access to inpatient residential detox. And there's also a young person service here for people under the age of 25. Um, and we have access to um, <clears throat> services that come in to help with uh, employment as well, IPS. Um, they come in on a weekly basis to help those um, clients that are ready to start work again. Do you want to move to the next slide, Barney? So this is just showing you the, the, the ways that you can, <coughs> excuse me, refer to our services. And I'm happy for that, obviously, to be, to be sent out if that's possible so that everyone's got it. Next slide, Barney. And there is a, this can be sent out as well. There's an online, uh, there's quite a few online. This is this is one that we use, but this one has actually got a number of apps now that people can use to help them monitor and manage their alcohol and or, or drug use. Um, so if people are technologically minded, these can be um, really useful. We're quite old school here. We'll give people out diaries for, for them to use. Next slide, Barney. Thank you. So within just regarding what we're trying to do within mental health services and making a more collaborative approach is that we're aiming to expand the link that we have for mental health services, which is going really well at the moment and improve a joint working arrangement <clears throat> but for the information sharing and data, which can be quite challenging because we're not an NHS service. Um, but we, uh, we have a dual diagnosis nurse who's been given access to that. So that means that notes flowing from, from Rio um, what have you it is a lot easier now um, and we are looking at kind of co-located hopefully trying to find space at Red Hill and um, Springwell uh, because we've got a number of clients that are there as well and they're areas that they feel comfortable in going in going to because they're probably uh, more used to going there than our service so with regards to I mean mental health within the substance misuse um, field I would say you know, the larger portion of people that are coming through have some kind of level of mental health, whether that's a previous experience of um, an isolated incident of trauma or people coming through with anxiety and depression, kind of more at the lower end, <clears throat> right up, obviously, to, to, the, to the higher end uh, of the mental health spectrum. Um, and a lot of people self-medicating, as I'm sure you, you're, you all know. There's a high proportion of people that are self-medicating for either undiagnosed or unmanaged mental health or just on top of their prescribed medication. So my role specifically as a dual diagnosis worker is to support that higher kind of quarter of people that we have, um, ensuring that they're accessing the right mental health support um, and the, the organising joint meetings and ensuring that everybody kind of working in a collaborative way so that we are recognising the impact of um, somebody's substance use um, on their mental health and, and how that interacts with their medication because often we can be seen as a little bit of a sort of outside um, service and it's not always seen that it's kind of part of the uh, main concerns for that individual. That, that's all that. That's me.
Yeah, therefore, I think, can we um, hand over, therefore, if there aren't any questions to our next speaker, um, who is Stuart Goodman from Rainbow Money Advice, who's going to talk about the impact of low income and debt on people's mental health. So if I can hand over to you, Stuart. Thank you. Thank you, Caroline. And uh, thank you, Kimberly. That was an interesting talk. And I think we'll be working together for our clients who uh, have addictions. Um, so um, good morning, all. Uh, yeah, my name is Stuart Goodman and I run Rainbow Money Advice. So thank you, Tola, for inviting me to be part of this important event. So why there is an unequal world and why people suffer from mental health are complex issues. I'm going to tell you how Rainbow Money Advice can help. My presentation slides will be circulated along with our publicity flyer. So after a bit about me, I will tell you about our service, what we do and what we've achieved. I will also explain some of the financial challenges that are likely to lead to increased demand. And can I have the next slide, please? So, um, just say that my many years in the civil service and latterly as a full-time union rep helped me to join Citizens Advice in Barnet when I retired. I volunteered with them for eight years and their training and the experience I gained enabled me to set up Rainbow Money Advice. Um, so I think we want the next slide, please. So our service is provided by Barnet Community Projects. They're a charity based in the Rainbow Centre in the Dollis Valley Estate in Barnet. The Community Centre provides a range of help, including a food bank and a lunch club for school children. And one of their aims had been to support residents with money issues. And after I left Citizens Advice, Barnet Community Projects asked me to launch a money advice service. We started by helping local residents. The word spread and now clients are signposted and referred to us by numerous organisations, including Barnet Wellbeing and also social prescribers. We're part of a network of 160 centres supported by a national charity called Community Money Advice. Next, please. So Rainbow Money Advice gives help and hope to people with money problems. And we do this by providing a free of charge service. Initially face to face, COVID forced us to provide a remote service from home and using Zoom, WhatsApp and telephone. Although we are returning to the Rainbow Centre, we've been asked to continue advising remotely for those having difficulty leaving their home, some due to mental health issues, some for mobility issues. So next, please. So Rainbow Money Advice help people with their debts, but also with budgeting and welfare benefits. So to be clear, we don't actually give money, but we give advice by appointment to people living or working in the Borough of Barnet. Many clients want advice on how to deal with their issues themselves. Um, but we also take on a limited amount of casework for those who struggle with a self-help approach, particularly if they're not able to write letters or make phone calls. Um, so uh, next slide, please. So at a previous hub event, I explained that we were a victim of our own success and that demand for our services had led to longer waits for appointments. Well, we now have a super second advisor, Fanta Sharif. So Rainbow Money Advice is now in a position to offer appointments two days a week. 
So we're still a small charity with limited resources and we're constantly exploring ways to meet the huge demand for our services. So as the next slide will show, we can have a look at what's been achieved. At the end of September, we'd helped more than 190 families. There have been cash successes of over 180,000 pounds. And that's 180,000 pounds being paid every year to clients. And that's mostly a ward of benefits. There's also a further 162,000 pounds in one-off grants. And that's mostly achieved by getting debts canceled and by obtaining grants. We also help clients with disabilities apply for things like blue badges and freedom passes. Now, next slide, please. Thank you. Now, this coming Sunday, 10th of October, is uh, World Mental Health Day. Many, well, most of our clients suffer from mental health issues. There is a recognised link between money and mental health. People with mental health problems are more likely to be in problem debt. And research shows that half of all adults struggling with debt also have a mental health issue. Most clients have been suffering with mental health issues before difficult financial periods or they develop psychological trauma during them. Next, please. Each client's experience is unique. And experiencing mental health issues doesn't automatically mean that you're not able to apply for benefits, manage money or deal with debts. However, we recognize that these can be more challenging for clients who have mental health issues. And also clients tell us that access to mental health support has been badly affected by COVID. So helping our clients is very rewarding, but it's particularly so when they tell us that we've helped improve their well-being. The next slide shows some examples of help we provide. So firstly, a male in his 40s suffering from depression and other health issues. Barna Homeless Action told him about Rainbow Money Advice because he was unable to claim welfare benefits or receive paid work because of his immigration status. He was in desperate need of cash and couldn't afford the bus fare to travel to get his COVID-19 vaccination. And it was too far for him to be able to walk to the nearest clinic. So we helped this client to obtain 50 pounds from Barnet Council's crisis fund. So he talked to his Oyster card, he caught a bus and he got the essential COVID-19 jab. And we also obtained support from the Red Cross Hardship Fund. They provided £120 a month for three months, and that enabled him to buy food. Our next example is another male, also in his 40s. Now, he suffers from post-traumatic stress disorder with terrible flashbacks. He has tried to drown himself. He's tried to jump in front of a train and he needed help completing a benefits review form, which he found totally overwhelming. He provided psychiatric reports to help us and found sharing them embarrassing. But by emphasizing that we're not judgmental, and by devoting time and patience, we gain his confidence and work through the form together. He was very grateful and the calm in his voice was noticeably different from his initial appointment. And breaking news, his benefit has now been renewed. Our next example is a lady who has incurred loads of, loads of debts. 
She was diagnosed with serious, complex, and long-standing psychological difficulties. And she was overwhelmed by stress and anxiety. And using something called a debt and mental health evidence form and her financial statements, we managed to get her debt cancelled. I hope these few examples give a flavour of the help we provide and successful outcomes like these have led to further inquiries. So next slide, please. Thank you. So we expect even more inquiries because people are facing increased financial pressures. So we joined the campaign to keep the £20 a week universal credit. And we've also argued that it should be extended to all families receiving benefits. The end of the furlough scheme is expected to affect a million people nationally. And of course, not all are going to find jobs. Now, not only are incomes falling, our spends are rising. This includes petrol up 11%, energy prices up 25%, and of course, increased spends will also impact on the cost of food. So food banks are standing by for increased demand from them. So in the next slide, please, I want to remind you that we provide help and hope. So if you or someone you know is struggling with a benefits issue, unable to make ends meet, or in debt, do seek money advice without delay. Rainbow Money Advice provides free and confidential money advice. On your side, we're people you can turn to without being judged. We have experience and skills to support you. So, next slide shows our contact details and you can contact us by email phone text or whatsapp appointments are available with me on tuesdays or with fanta on wednesdays do have a look at our website and look out for the publicity fly being circulated with these slides i hope you found this useful and thank you for listening to me and I'm going to hand over to John Choi. If, if I can just start off to, to sort of thank Stuart and also thank Kimberly as well, because through the Wellbeing Hub, the work that we've worked on together, um, it's been a critical service uh, really for to support the community. Many, many people have, have experienced these, these issues and um, uh, being connected to Stuart's service, also Kimberly's has been vitally important to support them and no more so during the pandemic as well. Um, uh, we, we share your view in terms of the, the challenges that, that, that lie ahead um, and, uh, and, and see there's an increased need and demand for, for those services. Um, and it's actually brilliant that you've got Fanta on, on board as well uh, to, help share, to help share the load. I know that Stuart's been brilliant in terms of ta uh, taking that on. Um, so uh, thanks, Stuart. Um, so my name's John Trom. I'm the Operations Manager of Meridian Wellbeing and also the Barnet Wellbeing Hub. Um, and uh, um, just to start off with, the, the, the success of the Barnet Wellbeing Hub has been really testament to the collaborative work that we have with organisations such as Stuart's and, and Kimberley's to connect people up to those appropriate services when they're most in, in need. And uh, we know there's hundreds of, of services out there that we've done, uh, that we've connected people to, and that's been that's so important community to keep people able to uh, build that resilience and, and maintain their, their well-being, uh, in, uh, especially now. Uh, with the pandemic uh, and it's from the success of, 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 of that work through um, the, the Barnet Wellbeing Services that we're pleased to talk to you about uh, this new service, uh, the integrated VCS um, uh, service working together with the Mental Health Trust. Um, so can the next slide please Barney. Um, so the, our vision of, of, of this service is, is around really combining and, and working together with the trust together to provide that integrated platform for people to work with. So it's a brand new service, which um, is um, from direct referral from within the trust, at least initially. Um, and it's really about combining the, the, the best elements of 
um, uh, the, the the clinical interventions that the um, uh, the trust deliver, and also the the wide uh, community um, support that is around and, and, and available uh, in Barnet, and really marry them together. Uh, come next slide, please, Barney. Um, so when looking at the sort of the, the determinants of people's mental health and their outcomes. Um, it, uh, in terms of the proportion, what we can see is actually the, um, uh, the studies show that around 20% is around their clinical care, whilst around 80% is more around their social route. So by social route, we're talking about education, about housing, about money, um, uh, and, and lots of social aspects. So you see that the, the, the key area is, is uh, and the vast majority of people's issues stem from, from the social, uh, social routes. Um, so the idea for, for this is, that we're trying to better combine together the, the, um, the clinical support that, that people do need, and then also the social aspects of, of their well-being as well to bring them together. Do you have the next slide, please, Barney. So what we see um, uh, for, for, for this new service is about creating that bridge in between the clinical teams at the, uh, the Mental Health Trust, and also that, that connection with the wider voluntary sector. So we've done some of that work with the Wellbeing Hub and other work uh, by the Wellbeing Services as well, but this is a really truly co coherent effort in order to really marry them uh, together to bring the strengths of both sides and to deliver the, uh, uh, a coherent and, and um, uh, uh, efficient, uh, uh, suitable service for the individuals to help them to actually transition between um, clinical inputs and into the, the, the community. Um, so you see that there is, is uh, Wellbeing Together, which is a new consortium that we've formed. And some of the slides later on will show you a bit more about that. Um, so next slide, please, Barney. Um, so this is the idea here. As you see, there's the expert um, clinical interventions that are provided by the NHS through for the Mental Health Trust. And, the, and also the expert um, uh, uh, community-based interventions delivered by uh, uh, VCS organizations and within, within the social side. So the idea is that that partnership would recognize both the strengths from each side, working alongside the clinicians. So you're not, uh, there's no cliff, the, the idea to um, reduce or remove the cliff edge uh, experience that sometimes people feel when, when, when the inter clinical intervention actually ends, um, uh, but really to bring those together so they can access those uh, services concurrently and get that support to help them to um, transition into the community. And it's really about co-producing and developing the service together with the people that use the service. So that means not only are they given the choice and empowered to help design what they are ac accessing, but they also encourage to be a part of that delivery of the service as well when it's appropriate. So it's acting as the bridge to the wider voluntary sector and maintaining the values and cultures uh, so, uh, the, the, the culture and values from uh, the, 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 the social community side that is about working together with the trust and bring the best um, service that we can. It's a, a new and big undertaking. It's a very exciting undertaking. Um, and uh, we, we hope it will, it will generate the, the, the better outcomes uh, for, for the people that need the service. Next slide, please, Barney. Um, so I mentioned earlier around Wellbeing Together CIC. So a CIC is a community interest company. Um, it's essentially a consortium. Uh, of, of four organizations. Uh, I think the next slide, uh, Barney, uh, that would actually show the sort of the makeup of, of the board, uh, so it's of, of the CIC. Uh, so the Wellbeing Together Partnership consists of four organizations, that's Meridian Wellbeing, uh, Mining Enfield and Barnet, Community Barnet, and also Inclusion uh, Barnet as well. Um, so it's, um, uh, uh, as you know, all, the, all those organizations are also part of the Barnet Wellbeing Service uh, Partnership as well, delivering the Barnet Wellbeing Services. Uh, and this is a new um, uh, 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 collaboration and partnership uh, to actually deliver on, on this new service. So um, we're working on the, the specialist uh, um, uh, and key strengths of each organization um, to deliver the, the, the various components. So Inclusion Barnet will be focusing on the community engagement and service user, user involvement, uh, being the VCS lead organization and also connections with the wider community as well to keep everyone informed and updated about what the, the service is about to help with promotion uh, and also to get service users involved, which is a key element of this whole service. Um, you know, we are delivering for 
for, for service users and, 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 and uh, that peer element um, as well is also important. Uh, I want them to be involved in terms of the development of this service to make sure that we are delivering a service that's suitable for them. Um, there are then four key components of the actual delivery and interventions. Uh, those are the community engagement practitioners focusing on personality disorder. Uh, so there's equivalent two full-time uh, equivalent workers will be um, hired for, recruited for those roles. But also the community engagement practitioners practitioners, which is more of a general uh, and generic um, uh, base. So anyone experiencing mental health issues, um, uh, not necessarily a personality disorder, getting that uh, more tailored support. Also young, young adults and engagement practitioners. And this one is will be delivered by Community Barnet and developed uh, further from the Young People's Thrive um, service as well. So they'll be leading on, on, on that area. And there's also peer engagement practitioners as well. Um, and these peer engagement practitioners are, are, are critically important. Um, they, are, they are people who bring their lived experience into uh, this service and really help to inform and help to encourage people to, 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 to know that there is a way out. That it can it can get better. Um, they've been through it as well. It's a, it can, can be a long and challenging journey. Um, but it's about starting that off, getting the support to encourage them to access the activities. And of course, it's so important that we have the volunteers to support this service. Um, uh, they bring so much value and bring so much skills and energy and uh, to it and help motivate the, the whole teams in terms of delivering this service. So it's a true collaboration and working together um, as a partnership, uh, representing the VCS and really expanding the work that's been done within the Barnet Wellbeing Services. Uh, next slide, please, Barney. Um, so this is quite a heavy information uh, on, on this size. I'm going to um, go through it relatively swiftly. Um, so in terms of the referrals, now it's not an open referral, uh, but rather these are people coming directly from the mental health, uh, mental health um, community mental health teams within the trust, and then handed over to what we call as a psychosocial uh, worker. So it's across the different components. So it's really about um, doing the triages and managing the risk, sharing the information so we are clear on what um, uh, uh, risk, risk factors are, are, are there. And also in terms of getting information from the, uh, the, uh, the trust and ma managing risk, that's also always the critical point, but getting the right information so we understand what people actually need. Uh, and in terms of what they would receive, uh, um, uh, a dedicated uh, project manager would oversee the whole components, uh, different components, but each service user would, uh, would be allocated a dedicated psychosocial practitioner based on their level of need. So whether that's PD, whether it's uh, generic community support, or if it's young person, or if it's, if it's peer engagement that they would, they would benefit from. And they would then um, uh, uh, receive a, a, a holistic wellbeing plan tailored to their, need, their needs that is co-produced and co-designed along with them. So they're making those choices about what service they can access in the community. And it can be um, uh, the, uh, integrate, uh, well, the idea is to integrate and have that seamless offer where they can be connected to, to existing services like the Binary Wellbeing Hub or Sanctuary Crisis Cafe, um, and then linked onto other services such as Rainbow Money Advice, Change, Grow, Live, other services in the community that um, they would really benefit from. So they're getting that tailored support, understanding their issues, and then, and then knowing that there is support out there in the community to help them with that transition. Uh, and it can be around employment, housing benefits as well. We'll talk about the social needs around there. And we do have specialist um, uh, expert advocacy services and, and a housing solicitor to provide housing support as well. Uh, and it's really about um, engaging and, and, and empowering that Barnet Mental Health uh, Network that I, I, that Inclusion Barnet lead on. And it's really about continuing to build those connections which we've made with uh, organizations. But we still know there's many more out there that people can um, receive. Uh, services from. Next slide, please. Um, so again, here's just, just a key, some uh, operational principles, and I think these slides will be shared, so I'll gloss over these. Um, the clinical supervision will be provided by the Mental Health Trust, uh, so you know that they are, um, anyone who's receiving the service will have that um, expert clinical support from the Trust. Uh, we have the project coordinators who are overseeing the service. It's about building strengths with the community, and it's a focus on efficient delivery, but also um, that, 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 that uh, in terms of not just the performance, but really about the quality of the service that people receive at every, every single level. And it's about building a sustainable platform, utilizing the, uh, the, the strengths within the VCS and providing those um, links within 
the um, uh, uh, different different services and that complementarity. What we mean by that is that um, complementing the clinical support with a wide range of, of, of support within the community as well and helping with that seamless transition into that service so that people can enter those uh, and access those services when they need it and, and tailored towards their needs uh, as well um, um, and, uh, and supporting them. Next slide, please, Barney. Um, so in terms of the outcomes uh, for, for the psychosocial support, it is about accessing when they need it, um, encouraging participation in communities, supporting their independence uh, and, 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 and that motivation to really make, help to maintain their well-being. So the supporting independent is a key area within that to allow people and empower them to make those choices to improve their well-being. That person-centered and goal-setting support, so they have those key areas that they can look forward. They know that they, um, there, there are things that they, they can work on and specific goals to their needs, uh, and they can then work on those and focus on those areas. Um, to help break those down in terms of the, 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 um, their needs. The integrated care, seeing both clinical support as well as service, different services at the same time. So they can access debt advice, housing support, uh, accessing social activities, as well as talking therapies at the same time. Creating personal connections and social networks, improving that uh, sense of belonging for, for people. Promoting inclusion so they are involved and feel part of the community um, uh, uh, in, in, in Barnet. Next slide, please, Barney. Uh, so how we, how we get the service up and running? And these are just some key areas. We're looking at a phased approach. In total, there are 14 um, equivalent full-time workers that we are bringing on board. So it's a significant investment from the trust, and it's really building on the, the, the work that we've done within the Barnet Wellbeing Services. So the initial stage, which we now, uh, is around recruitment and setting up the service. We're then looking to induct and train the staff in the various different components and in and starting that engagement with uh, stakeholders and the VCS, such as events like this to make sure people are aware uh, of, of the new service coming on board. Um, and then hopefully we'll have the service go live um, uh, once everyone is trained and, and the service is ready. Uh, and we can start seeing the individuals handing over from the, tr from the trust and, and the CMHT teams then be transitioned in the community. And importantly um, is to do that continued engagement uh, with, people, with those with lived experience and continue that service development to develop what we feel is a really innovative approach uh, and really truly integrating the community uh, services and approaches within the whole uh, mental health service delivered by the, the trust. Um, next slide, please, Barney. Can, can, can I, John, I'm really sorry because we, we're just about, is that almost finished? Yes, just, just done. Okay. Uh, right, so yeah, th thanks for that. No, not at all, because I know the next thing is extremely, thank you so much, and that's really brilliant, um, as always. Um, I'm just aware that we are actually going to have a very exciting link into a class now, which, as you know, is one of my favourite things, always being trying to get everyone to be active. Um, and so we're going to join um, live, a Pilates class. Hello, yes, by... Hi there. Hello. Hello. And Elisa, right, we just, I was just explaining that we're going to join you for a 10 minute taster, which is very yes, exciting. Yes. As you know, I love what you do. So there you go. So I will be joining in even if nobody else was. And I want everyone else to join in. This is very important. Now we are doing a little exercise with the dumbbell. So if you have a bottle of water, you know the little bottle of water, you can have a bottle of water in your hand. Yeah, exactly. And do the same exercise, but please bottle of water full of water, not empty. Okay, so let's start. Sorry, I have, I have my student here, I need to carry on. Okay, this is the way you have to, uh, you need to take the weight like that on your water bottles. Just one arm and let's go up and down. Let's do at least eight repetitions from now. One, down, two, down, three. Well done all of you. Four, down, five, down, six, down, seven, down, eight and stop slowly 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 change can you see it's not very heavy exercise is doable but it's very good to do it let's start a one down two keep your chest nice and open shoulders pushing down very slowly keep going a four go up don't go don't develop on the side keep going up a three go up Pausia, go up two and one stop always using one 
on just one, uh, one dumbbell. Now we are going to do some exercise for this area. Many ladies always ask me exercise for this area because it's always not enough tight. So let's start. Keep your, I hope you can see me. Maybe I should take a chair so you can see me better. Sorry. We can see, we can Let's see you. Okay, so arms up and with the other arms, with one hand, keep yourself and then bend behind your head and, stre and stretch. Eight, bend, stretch. Let's do eight from now. A one, A. Two, please, when you do this exercise, don't do this. Don't do this movement. It's very stressful. Go out, go up slowly and come back. Don't stretch your elbow completely. Just keep, let, keep that little percentage bend, soft. Otherwise, we stress the joint, okay? Go, I think we have done eight. Let's change, let's change. A, one, A, two, A. Three, up, four, rise, five, rise, six. Well done. Keep always your hand on the side of your ear. If it's too distant, we are not going to work with these muscles, okay? So if we really wanted to work with the triceps, the hand, the arms need to be really, really close to your head. Otherwise, we don't work enough. Now. Well done, all of you. With the both hand, take the one dumbbells. This is very small, but we are doing a light exercise here, okay? We don't want to kill ourselves in the morning. So we decided to, for, to go for very light, light dumbbells. So rise, a, again, bend and stretch. At least eight, a, one, rise, two, Keep your elbows very, very, very close to your head. So don't open like that, it will be not beneficial. So you need to keep always, yes, keep your elbow close, 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 close to your head, to your ear. Let's do five more. One, A, two, A, three, four, five. Keep always the dumbbell in that way now and front of you and stretch. Front of you, don't open, Fatima. Keep it always nice and parallel. And up, down, up, close your elbows. Don't open your elbows, keep it close. A, up, yes, keep your elbow parallel, good. Four, well done. Close, close your elbows, Fortuna. Yeah, so when you go down, they don't do like that. They need to go down straight. Otherwise, yeah, we don't work properly. Good, let's do four more. One, A, two, A, three, down, four, and stop. Now, read off of your, uh, of your uh, dumbbell. And let's work a little bit with the shoulder because after this work, we need to stretch a little bit and relax. So let's start. Six on the back, six on the back. A one, two, three, four, five, six. Now six forward, but please make deep, 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 deep circles and um, squeeze your shoulder blades. So really try to make deep, deep, deep circle as much as you can, very, very deep. Now we work with upper body. Let's go and do some squat. Feet apart in distance, arms. You can keep the arms, yes, here. And as you go down, arms lift up just to give you the balance. After three seconds, rise, rise. Well done, I adjust the camera and let's go, let's go. Two more. A, one, two, three, and rise. And again, one, two, three, rise. 
If we cannot do, please ladies, keep going by yourself. I will give you an alternative. If you have a trouble with this exercise, you can use the chair. Sit on top of the chair and stand up. Sit when you when you realize that your the, this part is touching the chair, there you are sure the chair is behind you. And then you can sit and slowly, slowly stand up. And sit, slowly, slowly stand up. Now, one more exercise is a challenge. Keep the squat at least for 10 second squat position. So five, six, seven, down. One, two, three, four, five. It's hard. Six, seven. Come on, keep going. Eight, nine, ten. Relax. I know, I know the feeling. Let's do one more time and that's it. I know this is this is hard. I is hard. This hard. Let's do again. Let's do again. One more. Breathe in. Get ready. And then down. Ten seconds from now. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Nine, ten. Good, good. Now, careful. I take the chair because it's no good as the chair. Now, let's try to do this exercise. Knee up. Let's do four knee up and four leg curl. Now we should be enough warm. Up, 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 and back, 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 back. Change up. Up, up, well done all of you, and back, 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 change, up, 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 and back, 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 back. So the last exercise I go, I go with you online, is a little combination. Ladies, follow this combination, will be squat, up, four knee hops, and four lead card. And then again, a squat and rise and four, three, two, one, and four, three, two, keep going. A down and up, a four, three, two, one, a four, three, two, okay. My ladies here can lie down on the mats. Unfortunately, I cannot do uh, exercise in the mats with you. So uh, I need to thank keep you so going. Thank you so much. Thank you, you've made our whole Thank you, thank you for inviting on. us. The ladies are very happy here. They, they were very happy to participate today, but I needed to really now focus on them. I'm sorry. Thank you very, very uh, much. I heard that before you talking about the mental health, and I think that the exercise is one of the, not the best things, but is one of the things that we can really use to tackle the issue uh, because is a physical activity, also social activity, because when the people come to do classes, they are all together. For this reason, they meet other people and I think can help. I'm sorry, all of you, but I need to leave you, you because so of rest, my lady. Bye-bye. Thank bye. you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye, all of you. Bye-bye. Wonderful. You see, that shows you. I, I always, I'm such a believer in, uh, in keep fit and physical exercise, as, as I think Julie knows. So I'm going to hand over now um, to uh, somebody who is, I work very closely with and is wonderful, which is um, Zaheer KXC. And she's going to talk about the uh, mental health awareness campaign that we're launching with many of the Barnet communities organizations supported by Community Barnet. And she's going to give an overview of um, the newest suicide prevention and mental health campaign targeted at men uh, with public health be running the support of Barnet Wellbeing Service. So if I can hand over to you, Zaheer, and um, Again, I want to reiterate, if anyone feels uncomfortable, please just turn the screen off and go on, on and have a look at uh, the chat and you'll see some numbers. Over to you. 
Good morning. Uh, I feel really warm <laughs> now <laughs> following that exercise. Thank you, Annalise. Uh, I'm here uh, today uh, with my colleague Emma Burton Lee uh, from the Council's uh, Corporate uh, Communications Department. And I think uh, uh, Amelia is also on the call. Uh, so we will do double act with Emma today. Uh, First of all, I would like to give you a bit of uh, an overview of uh, uh, suicide rates in Barnet, followed by some examples that how we actually work across Barnet and also across North Central London and in London to reduce uh, 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 suicides, number of suicides uh, in Barnet and, and also in London. Uh, every life uh, lost to suicide uh, is a tragedy that has uh, devastating effects across families, friends, uh, schools, uh, workplaces, and wider community. So uh, yes, as Councillor Stoke mentioned, if it is a sensitive topic, do feel free to uh, log off and come back later on. And there are uh, services uh, available in the chat uh, posted earlier on if you want to call somebody and, uh, and talk. Because uh, for every person who dies by suicide, Barney, you can actually put the first slide. Every person who dies by suicide, there are likely to be 135 people who, are, who may be affected. Um, sorry, uh, my doorbell is ringing at the same time, so apologies for that. I'm going to ignore it. Um, earlier on, uh, Stuart uh, Goodman uh, uh, and John and, uh, and other speakers actually uh, set the scene for my, uh, for my presentation. Uh, I want to talk about why suicide prevention is a key priority, but more importantly, why we're doing a lot of things right now, uh, because there's a strong link between economic downturn and increase in suicides, we know from the studies. And nationally, suicide is the biggest killer uh, uh, of men under 49. Uh, and, uh, you know, many people, uh, um, unfortunately, uh, made attempts, uh, you know, and, and, and suffer in silence. Uh, and, and many people also self-harm themselves. Uh, so, and men, we know again from the evidence that men are more likely to be affected by the socioeconomic challenges brought by COVID-19. Yes, men are uh, more reluctant to seek help, to talk about their mental health, uh, you know, to engage with others around their issues. We have Andy's Man Club uh, later on, uh, they will actually uh, talk about this. So next slide, please. Uh, the na nationally, suicide rates are increasing. Uh, that is a sad news, but we have a bit of relief for Barnet that Barnet suicide rates have been go going down since 2015. Uh, we, I mean, our rate is significantly lower than England, and also a Barnet rates of suicide are fifth lowest in London. There's a bit of a relief for us. Nevertheless, we still have. Uh, you know, quite a big task ahead. Uh, so we have approximately 22 to 24 suicides per year uh, in Barnet. Next one, please. So um, how are we working together? Well, suicide, uh, as we know, uh, is a very complex issue. There is rarely one reason behind it. And we know that less than a third of people who died by suicide were in contact with mental health services, as I mentioned earlier on, maybe because of the uh, uh, stigma around suicide and mental health, people don't seek help. And the vast majority are not known to any services, they just take their lives uh, without any warning. Uh, so we have uh, this year, first time we actually launched our strategy, first suicide prevention strategy in Barnet, and we have a partnership and please, if you want to join our suicide prevention partnership, do email me uh, uh, and you are very welcome to join, we're encouraging everyone to join us in this. Um, so we have a suicide bereavement service, I'm sure you have uh, heard it 
in, in one of these events, they came and talked to, uh, talk to you about uh, what, how are they supporting uh, people who are affected by suicide. And we, ha we have many, many uh, uh, actions and groups and services in place. And we are, you know, rest assured, we all are working together uh, uh, to, uh, to, to, um, basically working towards absolutely no, no suicides in Barney. That's our long-term ambition. Next one, please. Uh, again, uh, as, as, as Councillor Stock mentioned, we are now today, in fact, launching our first suicide prevention campaign. Uh, and our focus is on men, as I mentioned before, and Stuart mentioned before, and, and John and the other speakers. We want to prevent poor mental health and suicidality among, amongst men. And we want to encourage them to come forward to talk about their mental health and seek help. And if possible, maybe help other men in their lives. And we want to focus on working age men, uh, probably over 35, because uh, uh, some of the statistics in Barnet are uh, different than national statistics. Uh, so we have predominantly over 35 men taking their lives in Barnet, and we want to focus on lower income groups, men working in construction, men in contact with uh, other men, maybe through barbers and pubs, etc. Next one, please. Uh, and our approach to this campaign, first of all, I have to say that this is a long term campaign. We're just we're not just going to do it in once and then forget about it. However, what we want to do is adopt plan, do, study, act approach. We want to launch the phase one today, starting today, and we want to stop after December, evaluate, review, learn and plan the next stage and continue every year and you know, initially we want to focus on men. Next one. And, uh, uh, and uh, so, and our approach is make sure that we have a whole population approach, which we're going to launch a suicide prevention app. And then we have a targeted approach. So we're bringing Andy's Men Club to support, to provide peer to support peer-to-peer -peer support to men. And then we'll be working with Barnet Wellbeing Service uh, to, uh, to carry out some community engagements, going out to construction, etc. So this is our overall approach. Now I'm going to hand, hand over to Emma to talk about the details of the campaign. Thank you. <clears throat> Um, so next slide. I think so. From a communications perspective, obviously this is a, this is a new thing for the council. Um, the first time that we're launching a campaign at this level, uh, we've we've bucketed that up into to kind of three key areas. So building awareness and driving traffic to the Stay Alive app. Um, you know to encourage those conversations. Um, we're also going to be targeting venues such as sports clubs, football clubs, pubs, and barbers and men's kind of. You know, the areas that we think there is high traffic um, and also tying up with GLL there as well and the better gyms to support the download for, for the Stay Alive app. We're going to support with training and upskilling around the borough, um, targeting specifically construction industries, um, using section 106 to engage with developers around that, delivering mental health and well-being in the workplace support um, and workshops. Uh, um, and delivering zero suicide alliance videos. Um, obviously, we talked about joining Andy's Men Club, but also we want to have more of a community-led approach. Um, and this is great today to be able to talk to talk to everybody about it, um, and having face-to-face -face outreach and kind of that peer-to-peer -peer support in in the community is extremely important, um, and will be a big part of the plan that we deliver um, together of community partner. Um, next slide. So we will achieve the plan by delivering, we've already kind of talked about, service area will be a staying alive app. So uh, we're partnering with Grassroots Suicide Prevention Charity. Um, and we're going to be doing a lot of digital work to, to support that in terms of um, getting everybody to download that staying alive app. 
uh, setting up a, a Andy's Man Club. I'll come on to talk about that. And then Zero Alliance, which we've already spoken about, but um, trying to make sure that we're really doing some outreach work with um, bringing, you know, making sure that, that men are starting to open up a bit more and starting to work together to, to start talking about issues that are facing them. Next slide. I won't steal the funder from Ollie, who's coming up next, but essentially we, we are dedicated to setting up our own Barnet, which will be the first in London, um, Andy's Men Club. So we're just in discussions at the moment about locations um, and trying to get that set up as soon as we possibly can. Um, our plans are going very well for that, but um, this is a national uh, charitable organisation that meets every Monday evening to support uh, from a peer to peer perspective. So it's really important for us to be able to, to try and join up with them and, and launch it from that perspective. But I won't dwell too much on Andy's Mountain Club, but in the next slide. Stay Alive app, obviously this is, this is what we're uh, asking everybody to download and I'll send a link out shortly. Um, but obviously targeting men, lower income groups, um, the, the app itself provides a lot of life-saving features. It's got life box, it's got strategies to cope, it's got our local resources. So, you know, all, there is, all, all of our partners are, we have listed in here in the app to make it um, adapted for the Barnet area. So um, NCL, we've got Rethink, we have lots of different resources on there so you can click through to, to go to, you know, the support that you need and the help that you need as well. Um, next slide. Uh, so we're tying up with uh, Better Leisure Centres as well. So um, they're going to be supporting us with running the campaign across all of their digital screens um, within all of their marketing spaces. Um, and we're also tying up with, with um, other clubs as well to try and uh, stretch, stretch the reach of the campaign to those specific areas that we, we feel that it's, it's important. Um, and as, as you heard earlier, you know, mental health and, um, and it, it can support you feeling a bit better with your, your mental health and well-being if you exercise regularly. Um, so it's really important for us to do this tie up with better health going forwards. Next slide. Um, so in terms of media solutions, we are um, supporting this in the high streets. So you'll see lots of posters and outdoor activity. There's going to be uh, bus rears advertising. We've put an article out in the next edition of Barnet First magazine, which will be dropping on residents' doorsteps this week, um, end of this week and next week. Um, I also share a link for that as well. Um, a big digital push um, or Facebook um, and uh, Google search and lots of uh, Google ads. Um, and I'll just come on to share some of the creative with you. Um, I think the ask is for everybody to, if you can, please share the toolkit, which I'm about to send in a link shortly. Um, but click onto the next side and I'll just give you a feel for kind of what the creative looks like. Um, so this is the example. There are lots of different iterations. Oh, sorry, go back. That's it. This is an example of, of, of the posters. So there's different iterations used utilizing um, different uh, diversity of men from different backgrounds and different ages to support the campaign but obviously we've got there you're not alone sometimes men can't find the words and if you're thinking about suicide or if you're worried about somebody else uh, download the Stay Alive app um, because it, it, it really is something that can be very helpful for you to download and, and do you know flick through in your own time. Uh, I'll just send up a link now um, but if you flick onto the next side uh, it would be really helpful if you could repost. We've just put out lots of messages on Twitter, Facebook, on our Instagram channels. If you can retweet those or repost those messages, it would be really helpful. If you would like to display the posters as well, I'm going to send the toolkit in the chat in a second, but we can also print those for you if you need them in, in your uh, venues. Um, please share in your email channels um, uh, and also you know, sign up, please sign up to Zero Suicide Alliance training, um, send uh, Sahar a, a, an email. She's just put that, her email address in the chat there. Um, and I'll let uh, Ollie come on to talk about everything else. Thanks ever so much, guys. Um, first of all, apologies. I'm, in, I'm sat in the car at the moment. I seem to have spent more time in the car this week so far than I have in my own bed, which I don't think is very healthy. But um, unfortunately, there's a lot of work to do around, uh, around the, the subject that we're going to be talking about. So. Um, I'm Ole, I'm from Andy's Man Club. Um, Andy's Man Club is a national charity that was founded um, back in 2016, um, following the death of a, a young man called Andy Roberts, um, which is where the, the charity gets its name from. Unfortunately, Andy took his own life um, and 
his mother and his brother-in-law saw the devastation, um, the natural devastation that was caused to, throughout his family and the community. And they decided to try and set something up to prevent um, other families, other men going through the same struggles that they saw Andy and the family go through. Um, so back in 2016, they started what was originally going to be a coffee group for men, um, a place where guys could go and just talk about any problems that they'd had during the week or any sort of emotions that they they felt like they couldn't possibly speak about them at home or in the workplace or or wherever it might be, but just give guys a platform, um, somewhere to go and talk about these things before they got out of control. Um, so nine men attended that very first session um, back in 2016. And as a result of that, um, Andy's Man Club was born. I was at that first session and the power of um, just talking, the the feeling that gave us in the room at the end of the session, we knew at that point that we needed to spread that platform, that network um, as far and wide as possible to reach out to as many men as possible and give them the same opportunity to talk and get things off the chest. Um, so fast forward five years, we've now got 65 groups nationwide and we have about a thousand men a week that use our, our clubs on a Monday evening. Um, all of the clubs run nationwide at the same time, uh, Monday from 7 till 9 p.m. Um, with the idea being that if there's a guy from Sheffield and he's on the road, um, it can attend any of the other clubs as well. We've also got um, an online presence. We've got a national online group, which means that we've sort of broken down those geographical boundaries and we now can now reach out to um, any men throughout the UK. We're currently working with Community Barnet to open up the first group in London, in Barnet. Um, we've had discussions this morning about a potential venue and things are moving forward um, very well on that front. Um, so the next step that we need is to engage with volunteers, um, guys who'd be willing to run those groups and, and open the doors for other men coming through. Um, Andy's Man Club is not just a talking group. It's not just a peer-to-peer -peer support group, although that is the fundamental thesis of it. Those support groups run on a Monday evening. Um, but one of the things that I always say is that when somebody's walked through the doors of an Andy's Man Club, they've walked into a new community. Um, our flagship group in Halifax, before we went into lockdown, they had other activities that they ran every night of the week. Um, so sometimes they went um, mountain biking on a Sunday, five-side football on a Friday evening, took truck bay walking groups, guys just meeting up for coffee. But what we found is that once you provide men with the platform to talk, um, they're very, more than willing to do so if you give them the, the, the space and the time to do so. But when they're sharing these, these deep and personal things with each other, they naturally form very close bonds and they want to spend a lot more time together. Um, so it's, it's about reaching out to those communities and indeed setting up new communities um, within within the existing uh, parameters of, of what we've got going on. Um, like I said, the guys go out and, and do loads of other things during the week, completely off their own back after forming these relationships and forming these bonds. Um, the guys that I've seen through come through the doors and it's one of the most rewarding things for me is I'll see somebody come through on a Monday evening for the first time they're nervous, they're not looking anybody in the eyes, they're shuffling the feet. Um, and it might be by the end of that session, it might be a couple of weeks later, a couple of months later. It might be a couple of weeks later, a couple of months later. Um, <laughs> the um, they become more confident, they, you know, they're holding these conversations. Um, one that I remember in particular was a gentleman and he came through um, and he had such a bad stammer that he couldn't even get a single word out at a time uh, because of, of his nerves and his anxiety and over the course of a few weeks um probably a couple of months actually um just being listened to and um, being in a room listening to the other guys he grew in confidence um he managed to get his story out and he's since gone on to um star in some of our production videos that we've released um through social media and things like that for so for him to go from that stage of, of not even being able to get a single word out to being able to speak eloquently on camera just through the power of talking openly about his problems and his feelings is, is testament enough to the work that we've been doing. Um, so I started working with Andy's Man Club about 12 months ago after being a volunteer for about four years. Uh, so it's now my job to travel up and down the country to help set up new groups, to check in on our existing groups, um, make sure that our facilitator team is supported um, and make sure that we've, we've got the right guys in place for the work that we're trying to do. Um, every club has about a minimum of three facilitators. Some of the larger clubs have, have 10 to 15 facilitators. So I currently manage um, a third of our facilitator team. We've got about 400 facilitators nationwide. Um, and all of those guys are men who've walked through the doors of an Andy's Man Club. Um, there's somebody in need, there's somebody who needs support. And then they've gone on to um, 
run the, run the sessions themselves, carrying that torch, passing that torch on, opening the doors to other men coming through. Um, and again, seeing the journey that those guys have been on, it's absolutely phenomenal. Um, but one of the reasons we keep everything so close to the core of Andy's Man Club is to make sure that the next guy coming through the door is met with uh, the empathy and compassion that he deserves and he needs um, and give him the confidence to open up about what it is that he wants to talk about. So our groups are open to any man over the age of 18. Um, the, you don't have to have had a mental health condition. You don't have to be suicidal. Um, it might just be that you've had a rubbish week and you want somewhere to go and get things off your chest. But the idea is that by talking, by opening up, by um, talking about these things and, and getting them off your chest, that it had stopped that, that final crisis point for a lot of the guys. And a lot of the guys that I've, I speak to on a regular basis say that they wouldn't still be here without the work that Andy's Man Club's been doing. Um, and again, I think that that's testament to itself about the importance of the work that we're doing. There's about 4,500 um, men take their own life in the UK every single year. When you boil that down, it works out as one man every two hours. Um, and suicide's the biggest killer of men under 50. And 75% of all suicides in the UK are men. Uh, so there's obviously um, a, a calling for, for the work that we're doing, a, a need for the work that we're doing. And that's the main reason why they are men-only sessions, to give men a platform to talk in a secure, confidential and non-judgmental environment to other like-minded men who might be going through something similar or at least understand the way that what they're going through is making them feel. Thank you very, very much indeed, Ollie. Um, Thank you. So, I'm going to hand over to Cecilia Petri, um, who's going to share with us some of the techniques that they've used to reach Eastern European men, many of whom experience poor mental health for a variety of very complicated reasons. Um, so if I can hand over to you, Cecilia. Hi, everyone. Thank you for the introduction, Caroline, and thank you all for having me here today to talk about our project and the work we are doing in engaging uh, Eastern, Eastern European communities and the mental health issues that remain or the difficulties uh, Romanian um, and Eastern European men face when it comes to mental health. Um, Bonnie, if you could uh, go on to the next slide, please. So the ROE Hub, uh, it's a project that has been set up last year by Community Barnet in partnership with uh, three uh, councils, Barnet, Harrow and Brent. And it was established at the beginning of last year um, to tackle isolation and consequence of uh, job losses. Uh, our ser service users have many difficulties and most of them are due to language, digital or cultural um, barriers. Next slide, please, Bonnie. Thank you. Uh, we support people with accessing health, education, um, housing and welfare services um, as uh, the Romanian and Eastern European communities are fairly um, new uh, community uh, people here face uh, issues such as um, language and we need we need to help them with um, registering with uh, GPs or register registering their children into school um, We've helped many people actually over 200 people with EU settlement scheme applications. Uh, which Europeans had to apply in view of Brexit. We support them when needed with food bank referrals, and we also have a service that offers support to victims of uh, domestic abuse and perpetrators as well. We are also helping with interpreting and consulate queries where necessary. Next slide. So in order to support our service users, we work in close partnership with um, organizations that offer employment support such as work rights center advice and support organizations food banks schools uh, social services and some of the social services we work in part, uh, close partnership with are harrow, harrow barnett brand and enfield we work uh, closely with edva organizations and solicitor practices next slide please So the profile of our service users uh, is um, that they are first generation migrants, uh, fairly young, between 25 uh, and um, late 40s, uh, with no support network here. Um, they have young families as well. And due to high costs of uh, childcare, women will mostly look after children and men will be the main uh, breadwinners. Uh, most men, um, 
in the community will work in construction industry. Um, next slide, please. Uh, the way that men express themselves when it comes to mental health um, difficulties is fairly different to the way women express uh, these issues. Women, as we all know, uh, are more um, open when it comes to talking about their feelings. And when it comes to this community, it's no different. Um, and we've come across men who don't necessarily talk about the way they feel, but they will say that they are stressed out or we hear from the women in their lives that they have alcohol uh, misuse issues. Um, and this is due to the financial uh, pressures on them as they are the uh, only uh, breadwinners in, uh, in most families. Uh, and also due to the stigma in the community around mental health, um, because this there is there is a huge stigma um, around this uh, because many people think that see that as a weakness or as being crazy still and they are just worried um, that you know them opening up about their mental health might affect um, their children as well um, and also one of the issues we've come across is that uh, there, are, there, are no, uh, there is no support in Eastern European languages when it comes to uh, mental health service provision. Um, even if we do have uh, service users who turn to us for help, it's difficult to find those services who do offer support in, in Romanian or, or in Polish or uh, in other services. Um, next slide, please. Uh, so if you do want to get in touch with us, I have put uh, some contact numbers here uh, and an email address and uh, we are happy to, to hear from you. Thank you for having me here today. Uh, I'm going to hand on to Zoe, who's going to talk to you about an interesting piece of work they delivered on empowering boys into uh, transitioning to secondary school. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much, um, uh, Cecilia. And um, it's interesting you're talking about the young Romanian communities and um, what the, the um, young people, the men face. But we find that um, we do have inquiries with regard to young um, men from the Eastern European community as well. So, um, as Cecilia said, I'm going to talk about our service um, for the primary to secondary. And um, it is relevant to what we are talking about today because um, our service is an early intervention service. And um, it's important that we tackle uh, mental health difficulties when children and young people are growing up and giving, offering them the language to be able to talk about what's going on before they get to the stage where peer pressure and also um, actual mental health um, kicks in, mental health problems um, kicking. So um, I just adjust my screen because I can't seem to see the whole screen from the way I'm set up. So I just do this. So I'm going to talk about the Be, Bra Be Brave, Be Bold project. And as a way of introduction, I'm Zoe Kata and I head up the Young People Thrive service. And um, we work across uh, three boroughs, but I'm going to talk about the work we do um, in Barnet today. Um, we deliver a service for young people transitioning into adulthood. And so this is for the 18 to 25 young people who are struggling with um, mild to moderate mental health disorders. So that would be um, low level depression as well as anxiety disorders. And young people can be self-refer or be referred through to the service um, by a professional. Thank you, next slide. Okay, so in terms of evidence um, for why we work with um, the primary to secondary age group, um, the research suggests that um, by the end of primary school, most black boys, um, particularly from the Caribbean heritage um, and young white boys who are receiving free meals are at par with their peers. But by the time they get to the age of 16, uh, they, the attainment is at least 12 months behind their peers, which is very concerning. And um, research um, suggests that um, there are so many factors, but uh, seven of the main factors that impact on um, young people's um, or black boys' attainment um, include, um, 
emotional health and well-being support. It also includes um, work with parents. It also includes um, uh, securing high early education, um, teachers' expectations and aspirations for the boys, recruiting um, uh, diverse workforce when it comes to schools, particularly young people who, sorry, uh, teachers or staff who uh, look like, sound like, maybe speak common languages as um, the young people in the schools that they um, um, are working in. And also offering work opportunities, career advice, and also having peers and, and role models for uh, young people. Um, the other aspect or the seventh aspect is also providing peer support for young people, which uh, impacts positively on the aspiration and uh, attainment. And also the boys get to see people who look and sound like them as well. And this uh, research is um, gathered from the Boys on Track um, report, which was produced um, and written in 2018. Next slide, please. So um, just to highlight that um, our work, um, which is um, the Be Brave, Be Bold project, working with um, primary school year sixes and secondary school year sevens, um, tackle the two, two areas of um, improving outcomes for um, boys, which is enhancing their mental health and well-being, as well as um, providing peer support. And hopefully by the time I get to the end of this, you see how this is actually working. So we set out to work with the year fives and year sixes in primary school um, to identify young people who could be champions, um, who would promote pos positive mental health with their peers and also act as a voice for their peers, and also to work with secondary schools um, from year nines to 12. So that was the aspiration. However, what we found is when we went into the secondary schools and we piloted this in two secondary schools, is that the schools working with the schools felt that the year sevens would actually be um, a better group of young people to work with, not because the older ones weren't um, adequate, but because they, the year sevens at the time had been through the beginning of the COVID pandemic and therefore they had a common experience of transitioning from primary to secondary. And um, we also worked with the young people to discuss some of the uh, difficulties they had faced, particularly during COVID and um, what some of the issues were that had come up for them and their families and where they could receive additional support. Next slide, please. So what did we do um, to, to deliver the project? We um, put uh, um, adverts out within the schools and, and with the staff identified some young people who came forward and said they would want to be volunteers. Uh, we delivered a mental health awareness um, assembly. And through that, the young people thought we want to put ourselves forward. So these were the year sixes and the year sevens. So what did our training cover? It was um, mental health support awareness. So we covered what is mental health, positive mental health, identifying um, their emotions, having long ways to express their emotions and how to emotionally regulate themselves. Um, also drawing on their existing um, strengths because the young people who put themselves for, forward wanted to become peer mentors. So it was important for them to recognize the strengths that they had. And um, what we found, um, especially with the, we had some um, girls as well, but what we found with the boys is that they could draw on sports because a lot of them, the young boys who put themselves forward were involved in sports and sports was a way of expressing themselves and, and identifying with their peers. So drawing on things like sports, some of their creative activities and strengths and some of the um, things they did around um, the computers was a really good way for them to boost their self-confidence and self-esteem and also realize that they actually had something to bring to the project. So we worked through um, the skills of being a peer men mentor. We, we talked about um, communication, active listening, confidentiality, and safeguarding. And with one of the groups that we worked with, they really opened the space for the young people talk, to talk about some of the gang activity and crime activity that was going on within their communities. And it was simply because we we're tackling these um, uh, important topics like confidentiality and safeguarding in a very safe space 
with members of staff to enable them to recognize some of the issues that they may take for granted within their communities or may feel afraid to talk about um, because they had to do with gangs and um, crime and offering them that space to build the skills to be able to talk to other people and talk to their peers. Then we worked with the young people to de develop their own um, well-being plan because for them to be able to look after other people, they needed to be able to look after themselves and also going through skills that they could um, use uh, to support others. Next slide, please. Okay, so um, we also opened the space for um, the young people, the year sixes and year sevens to talk about some of the challenges that they experienced um, moving up into secondary school. And um, some of the things were feeling scared, being lonely, um, struggling with the change. Um, and some of them were also concerned about um, themselves and their peers who may be living with um, disabilities and wondering whether there was adequate support for them um, in school. Um, worries included being judged, being late, detention, that was a very popular one. And also a really popular one was what, what they would actually eat in school because it was completely different to their primary school setting. And what was really positive is that the year sevens were able to share through video because it was COVID, we had to be very creative as to how we actually delivered the training and how we brought the groups together. So we used videos as well. And some of the ideas that the young people felt were very important was speaking to, um, a responsible adult within their community, like teachers, like parents, and also speaking to some of the peers within the school who'd been trained up. Next slide, please. So this is just a snapshot of the toolkits that we uh, worked with the young people on. Um, and it went through things like, um, you know, the different feelings, we talked through these before, and then at the end of the training, and once the groups had come together, they had the opportunity to write some of these things down that they could take along with them um, to secondary school. So looking at the comparison between um, primary and secondary, and then looking at the differences and thinking about how solutions, thinking about how they could overcome some of the challenges they may face. And then we also, of course, worked with them around um, strategies that, simple strategies that were um, unintrusive that they could use daily um, to help support their mental health and well being as well. And the last bit of it was actually having a list of people and resources that they created themselves that they could tend to when they were struggling. Next slide, please. So some of our outcomes, um, it was a six month um, project. Uh, we piloted in two schools, um, secondary schools and two primary schools. We were able to work with um, 33 young people who put themselves forward. Um, interestingly enough, um, about 80% were um, boys. Um, it's interesting, working with the older ones, we find that um, a lot more of the girls are the ones being referred through to our services. But then the value of working at the early stages, the boys were at a stage where they felt comfortable to put themselves forward and to work through this and be champions and feel like they were an important part of the schools in which they were in. Um, 23 year sevens and 10 from year six, one primary school. Because of the COVID, we weren't able to work directly with like, the other primary school. So what that primary school did was identify the young people who were going up to the secondary school and the year sevens held um, a morning session with them going through their um, toolkit and helping them to develop their resource, the resilience resource to move up with. Okay, so in terms of um, one primary school, part of what they did to embed the learning was to create an art project. And I'll show you some of the pictures in a moment where the school could um, demonstrate, the, the ESXs could demonstrate what they'd learned and, and um, have a space within the school that they could display the artwork. So the subsequent years coming up could learn from what the um, older ones who were leaving had learned. Um, the other thing that one secondary school has started to do this year is bring the year sevens who've joined the school with the year eight champions to work together on a peer mentoring program for the school. So they're um, based on the resources we provided to them, they're developing 
one that's bespoke for the school, which is really fantastic in terms of um, learning and embedding good practice. Next slide, next slide, please. So this is just a snapshot of um, uh, we took from uh, the work we did. As you can see, they're mainly boys, mainly from minority ethnic groups and including black, black boys from African and Caribbean um, communities. And um, the other interesting thing, of course, because of the area we, we work with, work in is that 90% of the young people spoke another language and even valuing the fact that they spoke another language was really important uh, to them. Next slide, please. These, these are some of the images that the young people produced. And um, they also spoke, we asked them um, what they thought about uh, the year seven's advice because for this primary school, the year sevens had to put uh, through a recording and they shared some of the things. They felt more comfortable, less worried um, and less nervous about um, going up into secondary school. And the other thing that they highlighted was that they knew that there was somebody um, in the secondary school who could help them. Um, just a quote below uh, from one of the teachers um, from these uh, secondary school, one of the secondary schools we worked with, who um, felt that the training was really beneficial. She'd actually seen the year sevens grow from when we started, where some of the um, boys didn't want to be involved and they just turned up because their friends were turning up. And that's the other thing about peer influence um, with, with um, young boys. Um, to the stage where the boys felt very confident, could stand up and work with the year sixes who they were training. And also the fact that the boys had language they could use if they were struggling and would come forward for help. And for the staff members who were involved as well, they felt that they would also be able to recognize earlier on young people who may be struggling because of the work that their um, peer mentors were doing within the school. So um, be brave people, think positive. Remember everybody's as nervous as you are, show empathy and be respectful to others. It was a really good one from one of the young people in year six. Next slide, please. So these are contact details. Um, you can call us on the uh, main line. You can also email us. Um, this is for the um, 18 to 25 service. And what I will do is, um, is when the slides are being sent out, is to include the flyer for the transitioning to adulthood service. So thank you very much. For listening. Thank you. Thank you so much as well for a really, really interesting um, a talk and something that's really so important with trying to make sure that, um, that people who are entering into secondary school and they achieve. I, I, I know from having seen many, many statistics how important that is. Now, I know lots of people have got to get on, but um, something that is also fantastic is our next line dancing activity. I mean, I, we, we, we really are the end of the session, so if you, you do want to leave, I know most of the things have been covered, but um, I think it is worth staying. I think it'll be fun to actually uh, do some line dancing. I have to tell you, I have a very big problem with line dancing. So let's see how we manage with this to try and keep up, but I don't know how you're going to do it. So can I please hand over um, and to our next activity, please? Thank you so much. My name is Kit um, from Meridian Wellbeing. Um, we have a um, Chinese uh, line dancing group every Monday. And now we start uh, physical activities and uh, our member come um, to join the dancing, uh, physical exercise and um, uh, uh, other dancing class. So this is our group. Um, they, uh, we are very pleased uh, to have this opportunity to perform um, uh, the line dancing. Uh, so I pass them to, to, to my members now, okay? Thank you. 
I think just to, to close, we are very late for time. So what I'm just going to say that um, I really hope everyone enjoyed themselves this morning. I certainly did. Well, enjoyed is not the right word, but actually got something from each one of the sessions. Um, and I'd like to remind people about supporting the suicide prevention materials and ongoing public health and wellbeing service mental health campaign this winter. Thank you everyone very, very much indeed for, for their time. Everyone gives up their time so generously and I think that's what's so important um, to make something like this work. Julie, thank you very much. Um, and I'm going to now hand over to Dr. Louise Miller, who is the Barnet Mental Health Lead um, for the NCLCC, which everyone now knows what it stands for. So over to you, uh, please, uh, Dr. Miller. So I wanted to thank you, first of all, Council Stock, for joining us and continuing to support the Hub Connections and Barnet Wellbeing Service, and to thank all the speakers for their contributions this morning. It's been a thoroughly enjoyable morning, and it's been very fun with lots of activities to do as well, and you certainly had me leaping off my chair at several moments this morning. Um, and I also just wanted to mention very quickly some of the um, support that is being offered in primary care um, with the development of primary care networks. Um, and roles such as social prescribing link workers, health and wellbeing coaches and care coordinators. Because as we all know, it is quite difficult to get um, appointments to see GPs um, and particularly over this period of time during COVID and recovery from COVID, 
Um, this hopefully will help alleviate um, people's problems with access, uh, as a lot of people can self-refer themselves to some of these workers. So I just wanted to mention that before we all go. And I wanted to thank again, everybody for a wonderful, wonderful morning. Okay, bye-bye. Bye-bye everyone. Thank you very much indeed. And I, I certainly look forward to um, meeting you all again soon. Thank you so much and enjoy the rest of your day.